Hi, and welcome to the ninth episode of Touring the Multiverse. This is the first limited series of the It's a Mimic podcast, where I, Dave, lead you... <laughs> you look at me like I'm going to be a shit about this, Dave. And Adam. You are being a shit about this. On a tour of one of the published campaign settings for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. Over the course of this series on Eberron, I'll be breaking down history, lore, settings, populaces, adventures, and player options. And I'm going to listen. Today, we're going to do the second part of the dragon-marked houses. So, climb aboard the lightning rail. Unless you haven't heard the first part, then go back and and do that, and then come. We'll, we'll hold the lightning rail for you. It'll, it, it's okay. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. But, whatever you do, just get on it as we look into the steampunky world of high adventure as presented in Eberron, Rising from the Last War. Fuck you! <laughs> that, was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, great. I'm happy for you. So this week, we're doing a, another episode on Dragon Marked Houses. We did six last weekend. We're doing... Well, we did technically seven uh, last weekend. Yeah, okay, sure. Maybe 7.2, because there was the, the Mark of Death. Sure, and, but we're going to do... We're going to do the remaining official six yeah, now. today, right? Yeah, so what, what did we hit last time? We hit Madani, Denise, Galanda, Jurasco. Galanda always makes you think of Yolanda. Vidalis, and... The Marks of Shadow, which is Fjarlin and Thorani. So those were the Marks of... Let me see if I can do this, Dave. Hold on, let me see if I can. That was the Marks of... I don't know what your Marks were. Detection. Detection. Sentinel. Sentinel. Handling. There it is. Healing. Yeah. Hospitality. Shadow. Yeah, the two Houses of Shadow. And so now we're back with the rest of them, which we're about to get into. Correct. Okay, and these are... That's it for Dragonmark houses, right? There is no aberrant Dragonmark house. Correct. Okay, so shall we stay in the same order that we did last week? Might as well. Okay, well, you're up first. Uh, the next one I had was the Mark of Making. Okay, this is actually the house that I've probably dealt with the most uh, as a player and a DM, and that's House Kenneth. This is a house full of humans, and their sigil is a gorgon. Before we get into who they are and what they... Like, where they're from... You got to understand that House Kenneth was centered in Sire. When the morning happened, they took a big, big hit. Uh, it destroyed the leadership of the house, and they also lost access to some key facilities. Uh, if you recall, in Sire, there was a city called Making, and that is all changed now. Like it's fundamentally different. All right, they lost a lot. This now is it's a city of Made. Because it, it's past tense? Well, it's now made of, like, isn't it, like, glass planes that are... Yeah, that, that are all around it and, and yeah. Yeah, so, like, it is made differently now. But because of the house kind of crumpling uh, due to the morning, there are actually three different leaders of the house, and they're all kind of battling for power. Oh, this is like when there were three different popes all at the same time? Essentially. There's the east, the west, and the south. I don't know what happened to the north... I don't know, but uh, we'll start with the guy in the east, and that is Zorlon de Kenneth, okay? He is a weaponsmith, and he is, or they're based out of Korth, which is in Karnath, which I guess is essentially the north. Uh, if you remember, the, the kind of southeast section of Eberron is uh, the, the Talenta Plains, Kibara. There's not really a lot there, so the fact that the east is more associated with the northeast doesn't surprise me at all. Okay. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of civilization in the southeast. Uh, now, on the west, there is Jorlana de Kenneth. Uh, she is uh, based near Fairhaven in Aeondar, and she's an alchemist. So that you can already kind of tell they've got different specialities. What you're talking about right now are the different kinds of artificers. And then in the south, there's Merix de Kenneth. He sets up shop in Kenneth Tower, which is in Sharn in Brayland, and he is the innovator of Warforged. So, like an artillerist. Yep, right. He tracks. 
like I said, they're all vying for power. Now, House Kenneth dominates manufacturing of everything, both mundane and magical. Uh, they can quickly produce common goods, and most independent artisans have learned their craft from House Kenneth. Kenneth builds the tools that the other houses rely upon. Kenneth is also the unspoken leader of the Twelve. Make sense? Yes. And, you know, remember the Twelve? They're the, the organization of all of the houses. Yeah, they're the, the council that keeps everybody together. And, I mean, they were prospering. They were doing so well during the last war. Everybody, they wanted weapons. They wanted armor. They wanted warforged. Kenneth created a race. He's a race. They were on top of their game. And then the morning happened, and it destroyed them. Uh, I think it was rumored that maybe the the morning came out of making that from House Kenneth. Maybe they uncovered something while they were trying to innovate the next big piece of technology. Maybe it happened to destroy them. Who knows? It's all kind of up in the air. But the one thing, though, that it makes very clear is that if you choose to be marked by the, the mark of making, you pretty much have to decide which of the three you support. Oh, not if, not if you choose, once you find out that you're marked. Yeah, but when, when you're creating your character, you can choose to be marked. Right? Oh, okay. That, right, that, yeah, that's yeah. what I mean by that. Okay, when a player chooses, they have to choose which one of the three sides? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So it, it, it's very, very, very clear about that. I guess that lines up with what you would do when you're building your artificer. Yeah, you know what? I didn't pick up on the artificer thing when I was going through it, but it makes absolute perfect sense. The other thing I liked about this is this is kind of the first time that we've come across Kenneth Tower in Sharn, the city of towers, right? Uh, we're going to get into Sharn in a different episode, but it kind of shows you that like this is not a small town. This is a huge, booming metropolis. Most of these houses probably have their own tower. They absolutely 100% do. Yeah, and it's, just, it, it's interesting. It's the first time we've come across this. Let me tell you about one right now. That has multiple towers. Oh, yeah? Yep. House Lyrander. And you'll understand why in a second. They have the Mark of Storms. They're run by Baron Esravash de Lyrander. Um, and this is all ha- half-elves. But don't call them half-elves. That's a racial slur. Sorry, I'm, I'm just curious. Baron Asrash? Baron Esravash de Lyrander. Baron Asrash. Okay. This is why I don't DM for you. Yes. Well, I mean, you you do. Not not anymore, Dave. (laughs) Yeah, well. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, you can't call them half-elves. That is a racial term. That You cannot do that. Remember, Eberron is a racist place? Half-elf is racist. The correct term is the Korovar, meaning the children of Corvair. Interesting. I haven't heard that term. Yeah. Um, And it is a big freaking deal for these guys. If you say the word half-elf while dealing with Lyranda, you're going to be kicked out. Which is a problem because they run ships. And if you're going to get kicked out, you're either swimming or falling a great, great distance. Yes, because it's not just ships, but also airships. Yes, that's yes. right. So uh, their emblem is actually the Kraken emblem. Because mm-hmm. they were all about ships and galleons and whatnot. And they actually control the weather. And their ships are known as being fast Faster than anything else, and they dominated all naval battle, all all of the seas throughout the last war, and even before that. So they've got a long history on the waves. Their headquarters is in Stormholm, which is a private island in Andar, and it's considered the homeland for the house's members because they don't really have their own. Half elf, right? Like it comes hard baked in, they get a little bit of edge. I have no home. Mm-hmm. Uh, the queen of uh, Andar gives them free reign to govern themselves there. So they are technically within, but they're like the Vatican almost. Like they follow their own rules and they enforce their own laws. Stormhome is considered the best vacation spot in Corvair. And there are many spies, charlatans, and sailors there. It avoided direct conflict during the last war, but espionage runs rampant behind the scenes. They've bound elementals to airships and galleons, and they pilot these ships rapidly around the world. They've dominated the seas for generations by binding water elementals. And now they've got lightning and air elementals for their airships. And lightning rails. They don't, they know they do not do lightning rails. Really? Yeah. The airships are relatively new to Eberron, though. Airships have only existed for eight years. Remember, we're four years after the last war. Interesting. So they've only been around for the last four years of, of, 
uh, it's, there's a lot of things that are going on in the last few days of the last war. It seems like everything was suddenly coming to a head and then suddenly the morning hit. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Airships specifically, I find fascinating when you look at the different houses because in order to make that work, you need House Lerander to pilot them. Yep. You need House you- Kenneth to make them. You need House Civis to communicate between them. I, th- this is why the 12 exists, right? Yep. To, to kind of facilitate all of these different houses is working together even though they are all very much separate it's interesting to see this overlap of not just one or two houses but a few of them yeah and as a matter of fact they out and out rely on each other to be able to have their industry yep so one of the things that is unique about this is that there are not that many docking towers for airships so you can take an airship but you can't get off of it in most places feather fall yeah right yeah um as you can imagine sharn the city of towers is quite fond of airships yes and because this is not just there are a lot of towers these towers reach into the freaking sky they're huge towers to the point where they separate the city not just by district and we'll get into this but also by height um there are like the upper and middle and lower parts of each tower all have a unique feel to them right so so the idea that there are airships that can move around the city is is a big deal now only dragon marked heirs of lyrander can pilot an airship and they study for months to understand the details powers and limitations of both the elementals and the ships themselves because house orion dominated overland travel with their lightning rails and now these new airships are even faster there's a rivalry growing the baron of house lyrander uh is ambitious and he wants what's best for all half elves they're very invested in developing the valinar elves first and they want to really help the new nation of valinar some believe this might be a new homeland for the koravar so they're looking to to re-establish themselves as a legitimate race of half elves makes sense They've also been known to be quite powerful in the Lazar principalities. Remember all the stuff about the ships and whatnot? They are known for hunting down piracy. Yeah, I'm sure that's a direct threat to what they're doing. Yep. They're also responsible for bringing rain to certain farmlands because they actually control the weather with their specific house guild, which is called the Rain Callers Guild. They also keep Stormhome as a pleasant, temperate place and not the bleak and stormy island it once was, which is why it's this great vacation place. They control the weather. Reminds me actually a little bit of Ryza from Star Trek. Sure. I thought that, that oh, hey, I captained an airship. How interesting can I be? Um, I thought this was going to be a boring house. They've actually got some shit going on. And they're actively searching for a new, unique identity. And I think that's really interesting for, for half-elves. That they've come together as a nation and said, hey, this is ours. Well, I mean, the mark kind of was the catalyst for that. Yeah. Without it, it probably wouldn't have happened. Um, but no, you're right. Like airship, Oh, man, I love airships. Airships are like one of the reasons I really like being in Eberron. Um, an airship battle? Crazy. Pew, pew. Right? I mean, uh, yeah, a ship battle at sea. Cool. You get knocked overboard. There's all sorts of dangers that come with that. There's really one danger you get knocked off an airship. Yeah. Um, I, I did a campaign one time where we had an airship crash into another airship that my party was on and the, you know they like interlocked and the binding rings broke and the elementals came free and started fighting above the airships as they're crashing and like it the the imagery that you can get from using airships is just so much different than anything you get anywhere else and it becomes in my opinion even more horrifying and upsetting when you think about the fact that there is a continent of dragons just over there yep and you on an airship coming face to face with an ancient dragon that has got to be a sight to behold yep um my guys uh it killed two of them falling when the airships crashed they forgot to loot bodies who had potions to feather fall and died they went splat yep well that'll happen yeah that was pretty good i still hear about that one they were they were not impressed uh, the next one I had was the Mark of Scribing, or House Civis. We have spoken about House Civis with Jed. Yes, right? we did, yeah. Uh, they are a house of gnomes, and their sigil... Boo. And, okay, I'm done. Sorry, Dan's not here. They're, I don't have to boo gnomes. Their sigil is a cockatrice. <laughs> okay? Their leader is Lice, Lys, Lysse, L-Y-S-S-E. Lice. Lice, Lyriman, De Civis. Lise. Lise. Lyriman de Civis. Lise. Lise Lyriman de Civis. 
How many more ways can I do this? They How are headquartered. Yeah. They are head. They are headquartered in the labyrinth, which is in Korenberg in Zalargo, which of course is the gnome nation. Zalargo, yes, Zalargo. Um, they facilitate communication all over Corvair and probably further than that. Uh, and they do this with their speaking stones. We went over this, like I said, with Jed. The speaking stones allow short messages to be sent long distances to other speaking stones. It's like a telegraph. Essentially, but you need the mark to use the stone. Yeah. Okay? It's not like you go to the house and the house is all like, here, have a private room to send your... No, 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 no. You have to give them the message and they relay it to the other gnome and then the other gnome gets the message to where it needs to go. House Civis also trains and licenses scribes, uh, interpreters, notaries, cartographers, barristers, heralds, bookbinders, and pretty much anybody that would work with words. Now, they also work very closely with House Kundarak, which is the house of the, the Mark of Warding, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, because uh, Kundarak does a lot of the banking. So any letter of credit from House Kundarak must be notarized with a House Civis Arcane Mark. And the Arcane Mark is going to be like, there are spells to do that, but I'm sure that it has to be, what's their emblem? Uh, the Cockatrice. The Cockatrice. So I'm going to say that again. Yeah, I did. Yeah. yeah. House Civis is absolutely neutral in all disputes between both houses and nations. Uh, they're happy in their little niche that they've carved out. Um, they are very friendly, they're curious, and they're engaging, but... It could was, they be more gnomish? Well, it was pointed out that this could be uh, a ruse, you know, this is... It's a front. Yeah, for, for other schemes. You remember there was the, the police force in Zilargo yeah. that... Employ what was I think a third of the population? Yeah, they're secret police. Oh man, like yeah, yeah, yeah. This this is multi layered. That that's pretty much all they give you in the house description. But, but there's a lot you can do. With there's that. there's a lot of information as well, and we'll get into it with the organizations about the um, the chronicle, the Kornberg Chronicle, yep. which will be strongly tied to this house. Oh, of course, that's how all of the information gets you know spread out to. Well, it's funny that you say that because it's one half of how it gets spread out. The other half is House Orion. House Orion is the Mark of Passage. And uh, they're run by Baron Quanti Dorian, who spends most of his time abroad campaigning for funds to help rebuild the Lightning Rail in the Mornland. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Their emblem is a unicorn emblem, which is referenced by the Baron's personal Lightning Rail coach called the Silver Unicorn. Sure. Uh, their base is uh, in Journey's Home. It's called Journey's Home, which is in the city called Passage in Eondair. Yep. They're traditionally human, and they are directly responsible for the mail and courier services across Corvair. They rely on both horse-drawn carriages and the lightning rail uh, that the house owns and operates between every major city. It also has teleportation circles in each of its enclaves, but they're incredibly expensive and only a powerful dragon-marked heir can operate them. Anyone can operate one of the carriages or coaches... But the fastest ones utilize marked members of the house who use vehicles that incorporate dragon shards. Interesting. Another use of dragon shards. I like this. Yeah. We're starting to see more and more of this now. Um, There's even a little known branch of the house that handles covert and dangerous deliveries. The house also has a deal with the Kornberg Chronicle, the newspaper that provides mostly unbiased news across the continent. Mostly. It's very, very specifically, mostly unbiased. They pride themselves on being unbiased. Mostly. Mostly. They help circulate the news and have many drop boxes in major cities for mail and packages to be dropped off. So this is really the postal service in a lot of ways as well. Makes sense. I think Kevin Costner works for them. Between the Moreland's blockage of the continent and House Lyrander's airships, House Orion is starting to fall on hard times, and as a result, it has started working with House Knith to try and find newer, faster means of transportation, and it's always hiring adventurers to investigate what exactly is happening and map out the Mornland. So, I just had an idea. You said they're, they're trying to come up with different ways to travel across land. Yeah. So I thought of cars. Obviously, that's where I went. I'm a car guy. I like cars. And then I got thinking, well, I mean, that's obviously not going to happen. No, we have infernal machines. But we have infernal machines. Yeah. This is where you can kind of cross between the two different settings. Yeah. Uh, you can take them from... Uh, Avernus. But maybe instead of soul coins, you're using dragon shards, but you're using them up. So dragon shards for fuel. Yeah. Right? Like This is very interesting to me, and I feel like I could really sink my teeth into this. So 
Uh, that's what I have with, with them. They're very, very, very mired in every other house and what the other houses are doing. And you can kind of get that feeling by the fact that they've got to rely on the others and find funding. They're mad at House uh, Lyrandar. They're dealing with uh, Knith. They deal with Civis. There's, there's a lot going on with this house. And the fact that they are sending adventurers into the Mornland as well means that I feel like there's a lot of plot hooks here. Well, there's so much potential in the Mornland. Well, here's the other thing that I want to point out. They had bound lightning elementals to their railroad system, and they'd done it forever, for generations. Hmm. Eight years ago, airships with bound elementals started showing up. How did House Lyrandar get that information? How did they learn how to do that? Was it House Kenneth that helped them? Is House Kenneth playing both sides of this? Is it one of the espionage, the Houses of Shadows? Like... How did all of a sudden House Lyrandar just hone in on what these guys are doing, but we're doing it better? I thought it was common knowledge that there were elementals used in the binding rings to get them to do their bidding. It's common knowledge, but how do you bind an elemental is my question, right? And it seems like only House uh, Orion had done that up until recently. And all of a sudden, a different house is doing it now. Are you sure? Because I did one module, like a pre-written module in Aberon. Now again, this was 3.5, so maybe it doesn't translate over the same, uh, where they ended up having to take a submarine from Sharn over to Zendrik. And the the submarine had a binding ring of water elementals, uh, or of a water elemental that, that helped it propel itself, sure. you know, underwater. So I, I, I just, to me, I assumed that this was already common knowledge. It, there's no mention of submarines in 5th Ed. There's no mention of anything else that is binding elementals, except for these galleons, which, uh, which are hunting down creatures um, or hunting down pirates and airships and lightning rails. Bound Elementals is not really a huge thing in Eberron the way that it was in previous editions. Okay, maybe maybe I am just getting the editions mixed up because, again, we had a, a cart that had an Earth Elemental. Um, no mention of that. Remember, carts and carriages and coaches and whatnot are now Dragon Shard powered and you have to have a mark to do it. Right. Interesting. Yeah, because I don't think the airships needed a dragon mark to pilot them in 3.5. I think that was different as well. Well, I'm going to say something else on my last house, which is going to further support my point. But let, let's see what you have first. All right. The, the last one I have uh, is the Mark of Warding, which is House Kandarak. Uh, this is a house of dwarves. Their leader is Morakan de Kandarak, which I cannot say without thinking of Mordekainen, and it <laughs> screws me up every time. Um, they are located, or their headquarters anyways, is at Corunda Gate in the Mororholds. Of course I got the one in the Mororholds. I hate saying Mororholds. <laughs> I'm going to have to continue saying Mororholds, and you can Mororhold me to that. Can you say it once more? Their sigil is a manticore. Sure. Okay. Uh, and they they do a few different things, but specifically they're there to keep things safe. Whether that's jewels, secrets, prisoners, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, they also have two different guilds, okay? There's the Defenders Guild. Uh, these guys train locksmiths and are security specialists. They are the ones that maintain the prisons, uh, the most famous one of which is Dreadhold. Okay. Is the other one the offensive guild, which just runs around telling people that they're ugly and shit? Uh, I mean, they are probably offensive because they're the banking guild. Ah, gotcha. Okay. okay. So they're just thieves. Uh, I mean, no. The dwarves of the Mororholds... I hate that <laughs> word. Um, I mean, the Mororholds are famous for having veins of precious metals, okay? And the dwarves of the Mororholds used these precious metals to establish the banking industry of Corvair. Anyone who is a banker or a goldsmith probably learned their trade from House Kandarak. Now, that being said, just because it's a bank doesn't mean it's a House Kandarak bank. Oh, sure, of course. Okay. No. They, but, they probably have their vaults and technology and wardings, right? Because you work with... Well, there are a bunch of different kinds of vaults. Uh, the banks that have the manticore symbol, the Kandarak banks, they have a special kind of service, and these are extra-dimensional vaults. Okay. Okay? You can store something here, and, they're, they're... and then you can go to another house Kandarak enclave, 
and access it from there. Oh, okay. So I like this idea for transporting high value prisoners, prisoners, escort mission kind of stuff. Like, yeah, right. Like, you know, you can go into the the one over here in because again, they all have uh, a foothold, say in Zendrick. Maybe you need to get your high profile aristocrat to a secret espionage type meeting in Stormreach. So you enter the extra dimensional vault in. I'm just gonna say it again: the Moor holds. They show up in Stormreach, they have their meeting, and then they go back. Like, you could maybe use this as transportation as well. That's really going to step on the toes of the um, House of Passage, right? The uh, House Orion, which has teleportation circles. This is also... See, I like the idea of this, and I like that it's it's dwarves, right? So, because remember, the dwarves and the Maror holds dug down deep enough to start finding demiplanes. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if this... Is demi plane manipulation. Well, the other thing is you got to keep in mind that in order to get down to Kyber, the Underdark, essentially, yeah. there are also these little the, doorways the, yeah. into it as well. Which is why I think that there's there's a lot of kerfuckery going on here with with demi planes, and maybe these little like, oh yeah, we have this extra dimensional bank over here. We that's actually a hellscape that Could be. that they have just built a room in the middle of because they're freaking dwarves and they will just build. Yep. Right, and so. And it's uh, this protected, warded area inside with, it just happens to have another door somewhere else. I think that there could be some really cool ideas, um, plot hooks here with the, with the idea of you going in and out of the demi planes and the extra dimensional spaces and that, like, there's some fun to be had. And again, House Orion is just getting shit on. Yeah, they seem a little outdated. Yeah. Uh, the other interesting thing is that the dwarves of the Mrorholds, uh, we went over this in the <sighs> Mrorholds episode, um, they are having more and more... Mror and more. More and more <laughs> interactions with the Delkir. Yes. The further down they go, the more Delkir they come across. Lord, I almost said Mrorican, then I almost said Mordekainen, but it's Lord Morican. De Kandarak uh, has sought to establish connections with the Gatekeeper Druids. Now, these guys are the original creators of the wards that protect Eberron from the Dalkir. So I find it very interesting that the Dwarven House of Warding is looking for the Gatekeeper organization of Druids that are known for warding as well. There seems like there could be a lot of potential in that relationship. I'm horrified that we don't have like a series of novels based in Eberron. There's so much shit here that I can't explore it all in one campaign. There you go. Start it. Yeah, okay. Let me just take all of my fucking free time and write. Yeah, you should write more. Shut up, Dave. Go fuck yourself. So that brings us to the last the last uh, house, and that is House Thrashk. House Thrashk is set up in all of the other houses when you're reading about them to come off as villains, but then when you get to what they're what they're all about, they change it a bit. This is the Mark of Finding, which first appeared deep in the Shadow Marches. So you're already getting this idea of oh, they're evil, they're villains, but it's humans and orcs and half orcs. Is this the first one that's had multiple races? Uh, I think so. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. What's interesting is that there are orcs in the house, but only half orcs and humans can manifest the mark. The other thing that's very interesting is that all the way through the entire book, Rising from the Last War, you actually see them say, you know, it could be humans or half orcs back and forth. But when you get into the half orc section, it does say that surprisingly humans cannot manifest the mark. Even though in the human section and on the tables and everything else, it says humans absolutely can. So there's a weird discrepancy in the book that people should be aware of. Hmm. Yeah, a little, little strange. Um, anyway, it's run by the Triumvirate, which is run by three different people. They all operate underneath the Dragon emblem. Now, a Dragon is a lion slash dragon hybrid. And it's D-R-A-G-O-N-N-E. Yeah, it's yeah. dragon with an extra N-E on the end. Yeah, it's a dragony. They're located in Zarashak, known as the City of Stilts in the Shadow Marches, and it has established the tiny port city of the Blood Crescent, which is in the Demon Wastes. Remember you said that there were only a couple of, of civilizations, that are, cities that have been there, one of them had just fallen repeatedly? Yeah. This one is still there. Blood Crescent, they assume it won't be much longer. Mm-hmm. You know, we talked about that before, but that is um, uh, House Thrashk in there. 
They're the youngest of all the dragon-marked houses, and they don't necessarily follow the old traditions of the other houses. For example, it doesn't follow the naming convention of house heirs. It's run by three major clans, the Aishta, the Torn, and the Veldoran. And the families just keep their last names. There's no duh whatever to it. Good. <laughs> right, I'm finally. Ti- I'm tired of these prefixes, the duh Kenneth, the ear Weinarns, like just just give them a name, all yep. right? You don't need to make it fancy. So these guys focus on bounty hunting, okay? It's the mark of finding. So it's bounty hunting and investigating, which of course directly steps on the toes of House Madani because they're all about detectives. Yep. Right? Um, they uh, they actually overlap some services and House Madani's a little annoyed with them, which is going to be a constant theme with House Thrash, by the way. Uh, they've also started pushing into the realm of providing personal protection, which is pissing off House Denith. They're also really strongly working with Drome in everything that Drome does because they're orcs from the Shadow Marches and whatnot, and they're, they're down in that area anyway. They've started to make deals with the or the Daughters of Sorakel. Yep. They started using gargoyles as messengers in Sharn, which of course pisses off House Orion. And uh, they are partially responsible for the expansion of monster laborers all throughout Corvair, including agreements for things like ogres who do manual labor and shit like that. So there are flying creatures that uh, will pass messages or move people from one area to another. They're rapidly pushing all of these monstrous races and all the monsters out there to be a part of civilization. And as a result, they're stepping on the toes of the other houses. Interesting. Yep. So House Thrashk, especially its main guild known as the Finders Guild, has recently expanded into prospecting for dragon shards. This has given them new wealth and influence, which is disrupting the balance of power all across Corvair. The Finders Guild is becoming quite popular and numerous, and it's known for being both discreet and cunning. The unique thing about it is the fact that it's actually just a loose collection of investigation agencies that are all flying under one banner. So they're just taking in properties and protecting them and giving these these new monsters, new identities to be able to go out there and make a living. And they're getting all sorts of dragon shards. Remember, the Shadow Marches is just full of this shit. Mm-hmm. They're also the main point of contact between the Shadow Marches and the rest of Corvair. So there's like a diplomatic side to them as well. And they've got interests in other regions as well. They've got a good relationship with all the monsters in Drome. Um, they're also a uh, strong presence in Kabara, where they've got this massive mining operation. Which leads me to believe that, no, they're not binding elementals. If you're going to mine, you'd think that you'd be binding earth elementals to help. And... No, it's just monsters digging for them. Keeping in mind that as they're fucking around with monsters and stuff, House of Vidalis is going to be like, hey, what the hell? We, we're the monster guys. Also, if they're digging around and mining, that'll probably piss off some dwarves. Yeah, what happens when they find their own little demiplanes and, right. and whatnot? So they just finished uh, construction on a new um, hall in the capital of Zalargo. And they're setting up a powerful prospector's guild there to edge in on all of this, um, all of the wealth and whatnot. So as you can imagine, they're going to be directly up against Mm -hmm. the mark of warding as well. These guys are new, fresh faces that are fucking up everything. And that's the end of the dragon mark houses. So there are, what, 10 of them? 12 of them. 12, yeah. So there are... Well, 12 and a half, but also there also used to be another one. So they're... 14? Yeah, 14 question mark? Yeah, it's like, how many nations are there in Corvair? 12? No. 13? Also no. Probably like 17? I don't know. Yeah. You tell me. Do we bother to include where House Lyrandar, right, or they've yeah. got they've got their own island in the middle of Eander, right, but they're not considered their own thing, and Throne Hold is closed? It's so freaking complicated. You not only have nations, you have businesses run within the nations that cross all borders. And the nations have complicated diplomacy. The um, the continents have complicated diplomacy. The religions, which we haven't even touched on yet, have complicated diplomacy. There are and then, other organizations as well. Like the Kornberg Chronicle, right? Like the the Emerald Claw. Yes. Like there's... And, and you'll notice that the houses are not just houses. They also have guilds and businesses within the guilds. And this is a really fleshed out entire idea here in Eberron in ways that we haven't seen in other D&D campaign settings. 
Truth. The only one I think that comes close is Acquisitions Incorporated. I know nothing about that. Nobody does, but it is very much about businesses and guilds. And um, it's more of a street level. You are a member of a specific guild, uh, the Guild Acquisitions Incorporated specifically, and you are dealing with other rival guilds and other guild members and whatnot. But you don't get the big sweeping complexities of the political spectrum. No, and I even get the feeling that uh, Ravnica is a little less fleshed out than this Ra- although still complex very complex very fleshed out still but not you're right eberron is very open to interpretation there's a lot of very specific details in there and you can pretty much do whatever you want in eberron i'm surprised that eberron isn't releasing multiple books within its world the way that it has in previous editions oh yeah that was one of my favorite things about it is we didn't just have the Eberron campaign setting. We had the secrets of Zendrick. Like, yeah. there was all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Okay, so now between the two episodes, we have covered all of these these houses and whatnot. Let's grab our dice and say, what, what is the one house that really, really drags you in? What's the one thing that you're like, hey, I want to do a campaign with this house? And Dave, you're not allowed to choose House Kenneth because that's your go-to option. Fine. Okay? Okay. Let's roll. Eight. I got one. I got a one. Excellent. So you don't get to go at all. No. Good. Um, okay. So the the one house that I would like to use more than any other is all of them. Boo. That's a cop out answer. You're, you're a bad person and I hate you. <laughs> yes. Um, except for, oh, let's just pick one. Uh, Medani. Screw those guys. Nobody likes a detective. No, seriously. What's the one that you like? Probably Lirander. Yeah, the airships and whatnot. Yeah, the the airships, the idea of, like I mentioned previously, the submarine. Like, there just seems to be a lot of technological advancement that you can play with here that you wouldn't in the past. And I also liked to just, because they're similar, the, the uh, Orion, yeah. them as well. The, the idea of, um, like I, I had mentioned, they had used Earth Elementals in 3.5 to get things done. Uh, the idea of incorporating the infernal machines into mm-hmm. this i really liked that that was a cool idea too the, the modes of transportation all right i'm tired of being on a horseback and as you go through the woods the goblins attack you and the band of raiders come to you no 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 let's make this crazy let's make this incredible i had dire sharks attacking the submarine when I was doing that, I had fights on top of lightning rails. Um, when I was in Eberron, I had, I, I mentioned airships crashing into each other. Like the, the modes of transportation can really be a simple change to an encounter that you've run a hundred times to make it so friggin' different. Like it is, it is just. Yeah, location really does hit you with a new sense of splendor and wonder, right? Like, you can breathe new life into things. With it. The other thing that I really like about this is if you start off with House Lyrander, you end up, you can start off doing a pirate campaign for the first little bit, then have the pirates steal an airship, and now you're doing air pirates, right? And like, it could, that could be a lot of fun, especially if they're backed by House Orion. Mm hmm. Right now, you're getting into the guild shit and like a little bit of espionage. Mm-hmm. Yep. And House uh, Orion knows shit about the Mornland because they're consistently investigating it, and they have rails that go into it, but nobody knows what's going on within the Mornland. Mm-hmm. Right. So because they would have had lightning rails go into Sire, which doesn't exist anymore. Right. But the landscape is weird and twisted. There's a lot of cool shit to do here. Well, also, the Mornland will change things that go into it. Mm -hmm. So you could go in with a lightning rail that has a lightning elemental bound to it, but maybe that lightning elemental has a big, big change. Something happens. Or just the binding ring breaks. Just simply, it warps. Or it doesn't, and it just stops, and you don't know why. So, no, there's, there's a lot of fun, interesting things if you work on transportation, you can get so much more out of this, right? And that's why I like those ones. I would have to say that I would be a big fan of House Madani. Specifically because they're going to have issues with uh, House Thrash. And Denise. And Denise. And the two Houses of Shadow because it's all espionage. And if you have a detective agency, you're going up against that. This is my crime scene. No, I have jurisdiction. 
Exactly. Yeah. And and so if I wanted to have my big espionage campaign, I would go to House Madani because you're going to have to go down to find the secret police in Zalargo at some point. You're going to have to deal with the gold dragon in over and over again and the different, you know, pitting the, the, the spies versus the assassins. There's a lot of really cool plot hooks there. Uh, and we kind of skimmed over them at the first one in the previous episode. So we didn't dig too deeply into it, but it's all right there. It's so film noir, right? And I don't think we need to do a deep dive. You're already picturing halflings and trench coats. Actually, I was picturing detective noir. Ugh. Anyway, I, I think that while you're doing high adventure and piracy and air battles, I'm doing trench coats and magnifying glasses and, and espionage. Yeah. Right. And Eberron does both equally well. Mm hmm. So, and we, and we'll both end up in the Mornland. Probably. So, is there anything else that you want to talk about with the Dragonmark houses before we, we finally wrap up after two long episodes about this? Uh, well, I mean, we are going to get into the, the sub races of the Dragon Marked Houses yeah. later. Yes. So, I mean, yes, but I'll, I'll, I'll hold on to it. Okay. So, okay, it's, it's time to jump into uh, another one of the creatures out of the book. So, one of the monsters. And uh, I wanted to land on something that's a little bit more um, happy and pleasant. Good. After we did the crazy-ass living spells from last time. Yeah. So, yeah. I want to look at Valinar animals. So... Are you familiar with them? Do you know no. what they're all about? Okay. No, I don't. The elves of Valinar say that when their ancestors fought the giants of Zendric, elf druids took on the forms of animals on the battlefield. The cruel and mighty emperor, Cole Seer of the giants, he was the one that pulled down a moon. Yeah. Right? Um, he laid a curse upon the druids and trapped them in the form of the animals. Sure. Now, just as the ancestors of the Valinar guide their warriors in battle, the spirits of these druids can awaken power in an animal to create a companion worthy of a champion. Valinar animals have an increased advanced intelligence and power by the touch of an ancestral spirit, and traditionally they choose Valinar elves as companions, reflecting a bond between the ancestors of elf and animal. To be chosen by a Valinar animal is a great honor, and any such elf is treated with respect and reverence. Still, on the rare occasions when a Valinar animal chooses an adventurer of a different ancestry, it is universally accepted. Okay. So, there are three that are presented in the book. The Hawk, the Hound, and the Steed. But before I get into it, there's also a variant as well. Each Valinar animal can be customized with an ancestral gift, a supernatural trait granted by an ancestral spirit. So, there's a D8 table, and it's things like Bestow Luck once a day, a Burst of Speed, which has a recharge of six, which essentially gives you dash as a bonus action, that kind of thing. Uh, the Fey Ancestry, which is that can't be charmed or sleep that elves get. Camouflage, Lie Detector, Fey Step, which is, I believe, the Eladrin feature. Sure. If I remember correctly. Um, quickness, which is essentially the dodge action as a bonus action. And Shrouded Step, um, which means that it just passes without a trace. So, uh, which one do you want me to cover? Hawk, Hound, or Steed? Steed, of course, is just a... Horse. Yeah, magical blue horse. Um, Hound. Hound, okay. So, they are considered Fey. Okay. All right. They're neutral. Essentially, all, all of them have the ability to have what's called bonding. So what it can do is it can magically bond to one creature it can see immediately after spending at least one hour observing that creature as long as they stay within 30 feet. So this thing is going to see you and follow you for an hour. And then, bang, it's bonded to you. Okay. The bond lasts until the hound bonds with a different creature or until the bonded creature dies. So this is uh, until you die or we find someone better. Do you know it's bonded to you? While bonded, the hound and the bonded creature can communicate telepathically with each other at a distance of up to 100 feet. Okay, hold on. While bonded at a distance? While bonded, as long as you are within 100 feet of the creature, you can communicate telepathically. Okay. If it moves beyond 100 feet, you're still bonded. You just can't get the telepathic. The moment it comes back, it doesn't have to do the hour-long read. I, I like the yeah. idea of a dog watching you while you sleep, and then all of a sudden you wake up in the morning and you can talk to this dog. I like the idea of you sitting there for an hour in like a restaurant in Sharn, and there's a dog sitting beside you just just giving you the evil eye, just staring at you like, you know, I'm really creeped out by this dog. And I think it's glowing. Does anybody else see this? And then you get up and you, you walk into a shop and the dog just follows and is peering into the window and you're going about your day and then you come out and you're like, what do you want? And all of a sudden in your head, you hear, I just want to know what's going on. And you're just like, shit your pants right there. Yeah. Right. I like, that's a demon dog. Oh my God. I'm going to hell. So, um, the basic stats for it are, it's got an AC of 14. This of course changes for each animal. Of course. Um, it's got 19 hit points. So 3d8 plus six. It's an animal companion and I think that it doesn't regenerate like a familiar does, so I'm going to give it max hit points just because 
animals die cheap and easy in D&D. Um, it can move 40 feet. And it's got a strength of 17, dex of 15, con of 14. It's got an intelligence of 10 for a dog, a wisdom of 15, and a charisma of 11. So this thing is very much a blessed fey creature. Perception is plus 4, so passive perception is 14. It understands common, elvish, and sylvan, but it can't speak except tele- um, telepathically. And it gets a bite, which is just increased compared to other dogs and hounds, right? Plus five to hit. It reaches five feet, of course. 1d6 plus three piercing. And if the target is a creature, it must succeed on a DC 13 strength saving throw or be knocked prone. Other than that, and other than that, the hound has advantage on wisdom, um, on perception checks. Right, as long as it involves hearing or smell, which is standard for that dogs makes, and stuff. Yeah. yeah, dog sense. So it had the the plus four to perception, so with advantage, mm-hmm. essentially. So it's just like a super version of of another mastiff that you can communicate with you. But the thing is, and it doesn't say this anywhere. It strongly implies that these things freaking glow in with the artwork. That makes sense. Now they all have the same bonding. Every one of them can bond the steed, the hound, or the hawk. Okay, I like the idea of the the hawk like hovering above you and watching you and then being your eyes further on yeah one of the things that's different about it is it's not a familiar so you can't warg into it sure right and it's going to have its own personality so it's not just a pet you mm-hmm. can't just be like i'm gonna tell it what to do no you're gonna ask it what to do mm-hmm. right it's a sentient intelligent creature i like this as just ha- i would just hand out these magical beasts even outside of eberron right the idea that you would have some special bond if i've got a ranger or a druid especially a beast master and they've got you know their pet wolf that they just carry with them everywhere. I'm going to take this kind of stuff and I'm going to apply it to that. I'm going to adapt to this stat block, right? Because like I say, animals die this cheap and easy, right? Yeah, makes sense. Do you have any final thoughts about about uh, Valinar animals? Not really. I think they're just kind of a nice change of pace on familiars and animal companions, which I don't traditionally use. No, they're there for flavor. Like they're mechanically useful for tier one. Flavor in tier two, and they're a fucking liability beyond that, yeah. right? And so, yeah, I I feel the same way. I don't use them very often, but if you're going to end up with a Beastmaster or a Circle of the Moon or something, like these guys are going to have creatures that they love, they want. The Cavalier is going to want a horse. Sure. Right? So give them a Valinar Steed. And I feel like I can go outside the box and just apply the this bonding and, and follow the logic behind it by looking at, um, or when I look at other animals that i would hand out so if they have a toad familiar i'd give them bits and pieces of this stuff especially with that d8 table of special powers they could get yep for those of you that haven't heard the previous eight episodes let me say it again this entire series as well as other series on role-playing games are available on the it's a mimic feed on itunes spotify youtube and lots of other podcast apps so don't forget to follow or subscribe on whatever app you're listening to also check out recent episodes on www.itsamimic.com and feel free to support us by hitting that lovely sexy, delicious donate button on the website. Thanks for listening to this episode of It's a Mimic, Touring the Multiverse. You're welcome. You can check us out on Instagram and Facebook, or you can find me at the subreddit r slash it's a mimic. Until next time, I'm Dave. I'm Adam. And we'll be back with more Eberron information and crazy adventure inspiration next week. But first, let's go find Jed. God damn Jed. How many more times do we have to do this? Um, a few. <laughs> A few more times? At least. As many times as there are episodes? Exactly. Jed? Jed? Jed! Jed! I don't think he's here. Jed's not here, man. Jed! Adam! Dave! Over here! Come on! Over here! Why are you hiding Shut the in fuck a... up, Dave! David, just be quiet, man! Come on! Over here! Hey, Jed. What, what, what are we doing? Yo, well, you remember last week when I told you I had some things that I wanted to show you? But we couldn't really do it in public? Right. This ain't so public. Right, okay. Do you want us to crawl in that dumpster with you? Yeah, come on. Close the lid when you come in. Were you born in the barn? Okay, what are we doing in here?
Okay, regular inside voices, guys. Now that the uh, my home abode is uh, all closed up, you guys are good to go. Did you make sure no one was following you on the way in? Yes. 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 Roll an insight check. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Today I got for you the Eldritch Machines. These are the things that I was telling you about that no one else really should know about. There's a lot of dangerous, scary people out there looking for these things. And your old pal Jed, of course, he's got one for you. Now these things, they baffle wizards, the best of them, the absolute best of them, set them for a fucking loop. And they keep the world in all complete balance. Alright, you may have heard of these Eldritch Machines, but we're talking about creation forges, dimensional seals, storm spires, and yada yada, but today, I brought you the best. I got you a spell sink. Alright, so one of my contacts over at the Guild of Finding, they gave me a call when this shipment came in, alright? They said, Jed, come on over, sell it to your best customers. I said, I got the two best guys in mind, and that's you and you. But we're talking about the spell sink. All right, so this spell sink, it's got the anti-magic field up to one to three miles. One to three miles. It's going to be sucking up all the energy from that area, throwing all those spell hookers for a loop, taking away all their magic, and it can belong to you today. Is it transportable? Can you move it? I mean, if you get a couple of your buddies together, make sure you don't forget the controller, you should be all right. I was under the impression these things are massive. Well, they're fucking huge. That's why I say a couple buddies, you know, maybe bring in some of your golem friends or, you know, maybe some of your, uh... I don't think Dan and Brad are going to be able to help. No, probably not. They're, they're a little weak. They're your only friends? Uh, yeah. Y- you're my friend. Oh. You want to help us move it, Jed? Well, for a fee, I'll do anything. I bet. Oh, I <laughs> walked right into that one. Back to into it, I'd say. <laughs> All right, well, make sure that you set this thing up, this massive fucking thing up, is in the most convenient location possible. And this thing, just use your action, and it'll deactivate or activate with just a touch of a controller. So this spell sync creates an anti-magic field, just like the spell does? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you have need for an anti-magic field? I mean... I'm just wondering, like I said, how, how transportable it is, because uh, this might come in useful for a trip into the Mornland. Uh, it could be. How big is it? Massive. Fucking huge. Biggest ship in the sea had to bring it over here. Maybe not then. Hmm. Yes. Do you guys have a house? A homestead? Any place that you like hanging out with your uh, Brad and Dan's? No, Dave actually uh, sleeps under the desk at the It's Mimic Studios, so unpaid intern. Not an intern anymore. He lives off, off bean juice. Obviously, you guys never heard about labor laws. Chet, shut up. Um, all right, let's say you take it home, okay? You set up your fortress, you set up... Are you any of you into taking over the world at all? I have considered it more than once, yes. Of course you have. You suit the role. Yep. All right, let's say, let's say you bring it on back to your house, okay? Or your castle, or what have you, all right? This thing is going to take on the form of its creator's best interests, okay? So let's say you've got a druid, right? You've got this druid. They've got one of these uh, spell sinks. You know, instead of uh, instead of maybe a big rock, it's going to be a twisted tree or something like that. It really shows the characteristic of the creator. Okay. So it blends in quite well. Oh, it sure does. You can make it whatever. Could I make it a giant statue of myself? Absolutely. Then I'm interested, yes. Of course you would be. Um, are these things legal to be selling, Jed? If they were... Do you think we'd be in a garbage can right now? Look, I don't bring people into my home willingly, okay? This is a very special occasion here, being welcomed into Jed's house. It's cozy. Well, there's lots of room here. This is a dumpster of holding? Uh, Apparently. Is that why you're holding me? (laughs) I thought that was just because we were friends. It's not a dumpster of cupping, Jed. Stop it. (laughs) (laughs) It is a bit of a dumpster fire. (laughs) Hey, look, I don't want this thing in my possession for too long. It's a little bit much for your old pal Jed, but it looks like this might be something that you, especially you, Adam, might be interested in getting. Okay, I don't have a whole lot of gold. What are you looking for for it? Well, I mean, this thing's pretty priceless, but, uh, you know, (laughs) wealth isn't always measured in uh, coins and weight, you know? Uh, If there's anything else you could do, maybe swing some favors... You can maybe work one of my ships for a while, maybe the rest of your life and into your third child's life. You're making me nervous here, Adam. It seems like you're taking a really long time. I mean, it's just a simple question. Labor for the rest of your life, or? Uh, tell you what. 
I, I've, I've got a counter offer for you. I know of a guy in the Roarholds who may have a bead on a demiplane full of riches and passages to other planes you've never even dreamt of. Oh my goodness. If you're if you're interested, I can hook you up. Well, wait, wait, I don't want to be holding on to this thing for too long. Is this kind of like an instant thing or are we going to have to wait a little while? Uh, I can let you know by next week. All right. Okay. I mean, I think that's going to be okay. David, you're not interested at all? There's no, no this is sketchy. My mom always told me never to buy something from a guy in a dumpster. Your mom also told you to use a sink more often. But I got my cleansing stone now. Fucking use it, Dave. God damn it. Hmm. You don't use it? <laughs> okay, well, you can't smell it in here, but no, he obviously is not using it. I can smell everything in here. <laughs> I bet you do. All right, okay, okay. I kind of had a feeling this was going to be a little too rich for your likings, but that's okay. If you got a buddy that you say that you can bring over here and we can sort something out, I'll hold on to it for a little week, okay? Anything after that, it's a little bit too uh, too risky for me. Okay, all right, deal. Does that work for you? Yep. But until then, as soon as this lid opens, if you say a single fucking word to anybody, anybody that's outside of this dumpster... We're going to have a problem, all right, Adam? I promise not to say anything to anyone or even broadcast this on the internet. Fuck's the internet. Perfect. We have to leave. David, you going to say anything, buddy? Anything, buddy? Get the fuck out. Get out of the dumpster. Get out of the dumpster. It's too nice for you to go away. We'll see you next week. Bye, Jen. There's a string on the wall. Pull it. <laughs> it opens. It's like a fence. I'm like a fence. <laughs> yeah, all right, he's having some sort of existential crisis. Let's leave. <laughs> Goodbye, Jed. <laughs> Not a fucking word. Yes, we. I promise. I will keep. I will keep him in line. Sounds good to me, guys. Well, thanks for coming and checking out my humble abode as well. I mean, I hope you liked it. I mean, it's not the greatest place, but it's good for me. No, you, you said it right. You're very humble. Yeah. Got the double wide. It's it's real. I mean, I would I would take those raccoons to a vet. They haven't moved since we got here. But well, look, we'll we'll see you later. Ten bucks if you want one. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> Goodbye, Jed. <laughs> Bye, Jen. Bye, guys. What is a Dragon Mark house? It's where Dragon Marks live. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. We have to turn this Dragon Mark house into a Dragon Mark home. Exactly. <laughs> I lost the game.